Hey, what's up, everybody? This is JH. And I am BB. And this is the Chop It Up Show. What up? A podcast where we talk shop about life and business. Uh, welcome, episode two. Episode two. I'm feeling pretty good about episode one. How you feeling? About I'm it? excited. We have a lot of good feedback. So yeah, what was some of the feedback you got? Uh, some of the feedback was like, "Thank you, finally, for answering questions." Right. Uh, uh, some of the other feedback was like, "You guys need to do this more." Right. And some people were asking deep questions. Yeah. Uh, one of them was like, "How did Harlem Capital start?" Right. Uh, right. We had some other ones about people asking about mm-hmm. how do they, should they stop a business and start a new one right. and, and step away? Like, when right. do you know when's the right time? How yep. do you build your brand? All these different things. So yeah, and pretty surprisingly, good feedback. Um, surprisingly, uh, so we dropped this on uh, Instagram stories. We use a swipe up feature. We linked yep. it to YouTube is where we housed it. Um, but also pushed it through LinkedIn. Which did pretty well. It did really well. It did, in fact, the best. And just for anyone watching, LinkedIn video right now, I feel, is an incredibly underutilized mm-hmm. <laughs> medium. Yes. Um, and for whatever reason, when people people over time build a perception about what a platform is for. Yes. But those platforms continually try and innovate. Mm-hmm. And so they've been pushing video heavy. Yep. And right now, if you use video on LinkedIn, you're going to get rewarded. So for anyone pushing their own video podcasts or videos, period, use LinkedIn video. Right, and I will bolt on to that the that idea around LinkedIn is the algorithm there is is so um how do I say it? it it's it's so elementary if you yeah, will. Yeah, it's simple right, right? now. Right? It's yeah. very simple literally by being a practitioner on LinkedIn, liking, commenting, sharing. Yep. You can have something go viral. Yep. Or by again being a practitioner posting every day. Exactly. You can literally have information go viral and it's the most professional uh, social media channel. So people will not, there's no one who's going to be BSing you on there. Yeah. There's no hecklers yep. and people saying stupid things. Like everyone's adding value yep. and doing whatever they can to add to the conversation. Yeah. And to, to break, that, break that down a little bit, mm-hmm. I think what we're saying here is when algorithms first come out, like on Facebook or Instagram, they're usually simple. But mm-hmm. what happens is the machines, the the algorithm gets smarter over time. Yes. And people try and game the system. So mm-hmm. the platforms get smarter over time and yeah. it becomes more and more difficult. It's machine learning, basically. It's machine learning. The algorithms get smarter on its own. Mm-hmm. And so LinkedIn right now is in kind of rudimentary stages. Yeah. So it's easy for your content to be top of feed yep. by just liking commenting versus what you have to do on facebook right now or the reach Twitter, on facebook yeah. is really down yeah um, pay so to I, play for facebook right now pay to play so i just wanted to open up with that like really hyper specific nugget um but let's chop it up man uh, let's chop it up what's goody with you what's goody with me ah uh, man just working creative man I, i'm getting to the i <laughs> One thing that someone said that was really good last week was the cunning like a lion thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so basically I'm just doing my best to be a practitioner, doing my best to be a real creative and just get my hands dirty. Right. And so I've been working with Andy a lot on just creating video. Right. Sending him calendar invites to come to all the up and coming speaking gigs and stuff that I got going on. So excited for the summer and to be, you know, riding around getting it. Let me ask you a question. What out of all the things, because I've been watching you over the past <clears throat> six months as we as we've been working more Closer, closely yeah um what out of all the things that you've been trying has been maybe one of the most impactful things so this is the one that's behind the scenes actually i continually reach out to people every three to six months to keep them in the loop about what i'm doing any mm. person who i ever work with via email in terms of like an agency or what have you i make sure i set up an in-person meeting Every single time, 100% without a fail, no one knows about Harlem Capital. No one knows that I'm an entrepreneur. No one knows that I was an investment banker. Right, right. So right here is like you have to make sure you're articulating your value to people in person, especially decision makers who are the folks who will pay your bills eventually. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens to them, they like we were saying this a little bit earlier offline, people like to use the same people all the time. Right. And if they can tell your story better every time, it's going to be so impactful for mm-hmm. everything that you do mm-hmm. in a early to lifetime like partnership or just longer term partnerships. Mm. Uh, so, and yeah. spe- speaking of that, so last night we were at the, yeah. uh, a dinner celebrating Dapper Dan. Yes. Shout out to Dapper Dan. Dapper Dan and Bevy Smith. 
and Bevy Smith. That's right. Hosted by Marcus Hamilton mm -hmm. uh, at Jenny's Supper Club. It was a great time. Yes. Uh, but I that came to mind because you're talking about the value of yes. offline connection. Mm -hmm. And 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 just to preface this for everyone, John is one of the young mayors of Harlem, <laughs> and he was giving double kisses on cheeks and stuff, <laughs> and shaking hands and just getting in there real yep. tight and yep. and just. Yeah. Don't know how he was doing it, but John, tell us about being the mayor of Harlem or just tell us about deepening those relationships. Yeah. Um, one other thing, mm -hmm. I had a chance to listen in on some of the conversations and he would talk to people about back in the day when he had his first company, yeah. the dry cleaning or on demand dry cleaning service. And mm -hmm. he would remind people, remember, I was the guy who was taking all your dry cleaning right. and now look at me <laughs> just three, four years later. So right. please tell us. Yeah, no, that, and that's a... I had just realized in that room just last night mm -hmm. that um, it just it came to life for me that I've been laying the groundwork in Harlem for a long time. Yes. And what were some of the things that you did to lay the groundwork? As yeah, well? and so it came to life in very specific things. For instance, um, I would go to the community boards. I was going to community board CB10 and community board 11, mm -hmm. where you have all of the local leaders that congregate and that care about the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And in every community board meeting, if you sign up for a general presentation, they give you two minutes. That's all I need. In fact, I think Jeffrey um, and I think my brothers were wow. with me when I did some of my first ones. So that was some of your first public speaking ever. In, in essence, and they recorded me, and I remember being very nervous, but everything from like, it, it was just a, about being everywhere. I wanted mm -hmm. to be everywhere. I was in the community board meetings. I went to the, um, there's, a, uh, there's a local precinct here, the uh, 28th precinct, and yep. they have a community council, and they meet. Like, I went really deep and found all the things that people find like boring meetings, mm. but in all of these rooms are local leaders. Yeah, you know, and these are folks that are not necessarily present on the web, but they have a lot of influence in a town. Yeah, and so for me, it was very important to like dive really deep and get to know all these people. And I became known early on as like that young mover and shaker yeah. in one context. And so it's been really cool because the one thing that rewards you over time is consistency. Yeah, so they've seen me stay consistent and grow, and then you know you get emotionally invested. And so anyway, it was a beautiful night, man. It was a beautiful night of like just. Um, seeing you know old old friends making new ones, um, and that brought to me to life the value of offline connections. Yeah, and offline connections. I want to talk about online connections okay, actually a little it. bit. Um, I have a question. I've I've had this question for a while, and you you've answered it a few times. I'm curious about the impact you think your speaking brings to you, mm. um, and being able to have folks who can like repeat what you say, right. and having folks saying that resonated with me. Mm. Um, and even you just spoke yesterday at, at Propellify. Yep, shout out to Propellify. Yes, and you said that a young lady came up to you and said, if you were looking to have someone be moved yep. by your talk today, it moved me. Right. How do you get ready for a talk? Yep. How do you you know, prepare afterwards and cut the video. Just like, what's, walk us through it. Yeah, um, I appreciate that question. Speaking has grown, as you know, has mm -hmm. grown into one of the <clears throat> most important things that I do. Yeah. Uh, because it allows you to connect with the audience in a way that you couldn't otherwise. Right. Um, especially if you, you know, you have a captive audience, you have a room full of people that are interested in what you have to say. Mm -hmm. And I have found success in doing a lot of the opposite of what people teach you. People teach you to have a presentation. People teach you to, you know, have really well-defined, really rehearsed points. Yep. Um, all these things, uh, all these designs and systems that are put in place, I feel like are meant to um, make you win, help you win. Right. But a strange thing happens when you do something counterintuitive. Mm. And when you face the fear of not knowing what you're going to say, but trusting that you're speaking on something that you know about, gotcha. that's the key. It doesn't work if you wing it and you don't know what you're talking about. Yes. It, but if you know what you're talking about, which for me, I'm always speaking about entrepreneurship and venture capital and what have you. And I think that that has worked really well for my style of speaking because mm -hmm. people can feel the raw, imperfect authenticity and they connect with me because if everyone who's on stage before me is you know pointing to slides and like 
you're clearly having pre-rehearsed points and stuff. Like I'm sure that their that their stuff is gonna work yes. for them, but I feel like I'm able to connect several layers deeper when they say, "Wow, this is an actual person yeah. who's in front of me." They go through the same things that I go through, and he's being open about it on stage. Vulnerability is key. Is yeah. the key, and I feel that you can only connect with someone mm. to the extent that you are vulnerable. If you're not vulnerable. And you, and you present a perfect image, you'll never be able to connect deeply. That's true. People will never have that nostalgia or resonate with you. And that yeah. reminds me of a, a, of a saying. is like people will forget what you do, what you say, but they'll never forget how, how you, you make them feel. Exactly. Right? Which technically what you do and what you say is leads on to that. So exactly. just like be very cognizant of that. Yeah. Um, so cool. Thanks so for yes, sharing the, that. Yes. Bro. Speaking has been uh, big for me. And, and also because I've been able to record it, repurpose it, mm-hmm. then it turns into video <clears throat> content, then it turns into something that you guys watch, yep. um, then it lets more people know about me, it increases my audience size, and then someone asked me, this is one of the DM questions that we got, like, yo, how do you cool. make your money? This is a lot, one yeah, of this my is bigger income that. streams, because then when my audience is bigger, I get paid more for brand endorsements, or you know what have you, and so right now, media is kind of all feeding uh, feeding each other is triangulating. Mm-hmm. It's creating a lot of value for me personally. Um, but how would you answer that? What's the the main way that you're making income right now? Uh, the main way I make an income is through brand partnerships, mostly through Instagram. Uh, right now, focusing a lot more on video. And for me, I'm creating more of a, a lifestyle platform where brands can get inserted into what I do, whether mm. it's a morning routine, whether it's travel, or whether it's spending time with friends, mm. you can insert a brand um, into there, whether it's like an American Express, a Staples a article, the article lounge. Mm-hmm. Um, you can just insert folks into things that you already do, and it makes it very, it makes it a light lift. Because mm. some, some brands want you to do X, Y, and Z, and you can't do A, B, or C. And that's kind of like really constricting. And so right. with my agent, we get a brief and then we pitch the brand an idea. Right. And then we map it out. Andy and I go to work with like mood boards and shot lists and things of that nature. So it leads me to ask you, um, in the influencer landscape right now, you're probably one of the guys that is working with the highest quantity of brands that I've seen personally. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you know, when I look at your feed, you might be doing Amex one day or Brooks the next. And so how do you personally juggle hmm. um, dealing with all these brands all at once? Well, number one, you had to have a good team. I think it always starts with a team, having a good agent and the agent has good assistance and then also having like your own editorial calendar. And so for me and Andy, we're like actually carving out time throughout the week, every week. Andy's your videographer. Andy's a videographer. So we're just working on just being really organized, man. You gotta create your own process. Right. Um, an ed- editorial calendar. Some people don't even know what that really means. So for an editorial calendar, like it just tells you, all right, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we're mm-hmm. shooting from this amount of time. And then on Tuesday, Thursday, maybe you're posting and you're posting at 5 p.m. Mm. And so you get into that and you start to slot brands and opportunities in. So let me reiterate, you literally have your week laid out where you say, okay, I'm going to be document or shooting content this time. Mm-hmm. And that content that I shoot on this day, we're going to post on this day. Yep. And that's how you manage all the brands that you work with. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then you just share your calendar invites with whoever is on your team. That's good. Right. That needs to be there. That's simple, but effective. Yeah. It yeah. Is, there's not, it's not rocket science, yeah. man. I mean, it's for me, I just love the opportunity to be able to wake up, think about an idea and then create it. And then to actually get compensated for it to actually continually pay for things in life. Let me ask you a question. Um, Do you ever feel like, because, so I asked you, how do you make your income? You said primarily through brand partnerships, Mm -hmm. right? Do you ever feel like, man, I am just a walking advertisement. Like I'm only getting paid to, you know, promote other people's products. Like how does that make you feel? It's a good question. About like what you do. So, for me, it, mentally, as any content creator, you have to really have some type of interest and some type of like goal for making this stuff. You can't just be the person who is a billboard. So for me, being able to right. quit finance mm. and to be able to, like I said before. That was first goal. First goal, quit finance, be able to create with big brands. So got the first goal. Yeah, Second goal is like, how do you 
figure out the longevity play. Mm. So now I'm getting into lifestyle. I'm getting. Wait, into what does that mean? The longevity. The play? longevity play, like everyone is going to be handsome and, and tall and what have you. What's different? What's unique about you? What's your story that you won't get tired mm. of telling? Mm. Because if you're faking it, you most likely will get tired of trying to fake it. It's you're hard. Faking to, it, you won't make it. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 hard to keep a lie. You mm. know what I'm saying? Because mm-hmm. like, you got to remember where it was and where to stop and where to go and what's this one, what's that. So. For me, my North Star was to create a brand that talks about business, that talks about entrepreneurship, that talks about the experiences that I go through, mm. and then also wrap that around with what we're doing with Harlem Capital, mm. right? And so if I can work with brands and tell that story, that was perfect for me. Mm. What happened is answer. brands love the opportunity to work with a young person enterprising of color in a big market right. that knows things um, outside of just being a handsome guy. Exactly. You're so, not that handsome, by the way. Of course not. I'm, <laughs> if one thing, guys, this is the best time for you to be you. Brands want to work with you because you are different than everyone else. Right. We should not be trying to be like other people. Right. We should try to be like ourselves. We should dive deeper and have a, an entrenched relationship with ourselves. Kiss yourself. Right. Hug yourself. Yep. Grab your your hand and walk to the store. Take yourself mm-hmm. on a date. Mm-hmm. Become one with you. And I think you'll start to see that people are seeing that value. Right. And that super power, that special characteristic mm. that you have inside of you. And then you can offer that mm. to brands. You can offer that to people. You can offer that to other businesses. And it can really uh, help you launch what you got going for yourself. So, yeah. Wow, that Dude, was awesome, man. Thank you for that. I didn't even know we were going there. Yeah, and and notice I love asking questions that go a, le- a level deeper because you're mm-hmm. able, uh, I had never heard you articulate that sentiment, but it's, it's always a question that I had for you because you work with many different brands. Yeah. So I was wondering where was your, what were you anchored in? And your point reminded me of, th- that was really, it's, it's ironic because just yesterday when I did speak at Propelify, that was really the main message oh, wow. of my Well, actually, talk. yeah, take it away. Tell us about the message. Um, well, it was precisely that. It was like the name of the talk was why building a business is an art, not a science. Mm. And I think people get really caught up in the numbers of building a business because mm-hmm. now best practices have emerged. And so it's yeah. easy to get caught up <clears throat> in like what you think the KPI should be and you know all the numbers behind it. But from my personal perspective, mm-hmm. It's all about being in tune with the way that you want to do a specific thing. Here we go. Because if all of us, and so there's four of us in this room right yep. now recording. If all of us by, you know, it, it'd be unlikely that all of us were inspired to do the same thing. But let's just say all of us were inspired to go and tackle the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's highly unlikely that each of us would do it in the same exact way. Exactly. Each of us would do it in our own specific quirky mm-hmm. way. And then an interesting thing happens when you start. I've gone through it, still go through it. We all do. When you start, you're uncertain. And when you're uncertain, you seek external validation. Yeah. And so you start asking for advice. And that's nice because it helps you pave the road. But at mm-hmm. some point, you need to shift that yeah. compass from external to internal. Mm-hmm. And you you only get good at what you do the most of. So if you get, if you, anytime you have to make a decision, if you go to someone outside of you, yep. you're going to get good at asking people for advice, you're not going to get good at making your own internal decisions. Right. And then that's, if I could bolt on to that, that's the time when you make your internal board of advisors, mm-hmm. right? Now I can't ask for feedback from every single person out here. Exactly. I need to have these one to two, maybe three people who I really value, and I'll go to them whenever I need it. Mm. Um, otherwise, I'm going to be, ooh, we're in New York, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to be the person who can continually do my own checks and balances. Right. And, and I can keep myself level headed and I know what's good for my brand. Yeah. And, and we were talking about this yesterday, actually. Like, you are, you have to have this vision that is so crystal clear and so firmed out right. that when you tell other folks, they can't even see it. Exactly. Uh, we talked about, uh, we were chatting with uh, some of Marcus Samuelson's team. Yep. And they were, you were talking about. Yeah, the, let me the tell price. that story. Yes, so please. I, I was sitting next to, um, so it was pretty dope because we walk into um, the downstairs of the Red Rooster, which mm-hmm. is called Ginny's Supper Club. Yes. And it's like dimly lit. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got red kind of undertones in the lighting. Right. Uh, it's kind of it's uh, a, luxurious. It's an amazing spot. Like Harlem is known. Like if anyone knows anything about Harlem, Red Rooster is like the first thing that comes that up. That comes up. And Marcus has really been able to carve a lane there. And so mm-hmm. 
Uh, Brandon and I were fortunate. You know, we got seated all the way up front. We were sitting with Marcus Amundsen's uh, CEO for the company, Derek Evans, uh, and also sat next to uh, a gentleman who turned out to be Marcus's longtime publicist since ninety since nineteen ninety five. Five. He started working with Marcus when he was like twenty five or so. And anyway, he tells a story of like Marcus tried a project. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't go well. Um, and but Marcus, you know, he's been at it for a long time. So even though it was a failed project, he kept he came back to the publicist and he said, "Hey, West Village or Harlem." Wow. And the guy was like, mm, West Village. And Mark is like, come to this location in Harlem that I have. And he, his, the word he used for this site was a dump. It was a dump. <laughs> so the guy, the, the publicist who's been working with Marcus for years at this point, goes to what is now the Red Rooster. This is 06, 07 this when is it launched? 06 or so. Got it. Oh, no, this was 2010 because it's been around for eight years. Got it. So um, anyway, and it was just like a shoddy, bu busted down thing. But the way he told the story was that Marcus, is, I was like, oh yeah, and here's where this is going to be, and here's mm -hmm. where this is going to be the art, and we're going to have a horseshoe round, and the guy was like, uh, I don't know, and eight years later, all that stuff came to fruition. And this, that's where Obama had his fundraising dinner, like mm -hmm. he's made history for himself personally, for the village of Harlem. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I like that, the village of Harlem. The village of Harlem, and he's been able to really build um, a lot and help pave the way for young entrepreneurs like us here. Um, and he, and the, to top it off, the, the publicist said now, he was like, yo, he's like, I'll tell Marcus any chance I get. He's like, dude, 100%, you were right. Marcus had the vision. And so to tie, the, to tie it all up here on that point, it's you got to dig deep mm -hmm. and nurture that vision um, and do it in your own way. You seek counsel, yep. but only use counsel to nurture your own perspective, there you go. not to substitute yours. Got you. I got you. And that almost leads me to think about like, how you look for an entrepreneur, right? Yeah. Like for me, for example, and I would love for you to answer this question um, after I explain my viewpoint. And I think it'll be good for- He's like, uh, af after I go. Yes. <laughs> well, I just think that we're <laughs> gonna <laughs> have we're gonna have viewpoints where people can grab nuggets from both. Yeah. For, for us, at least even for Harlem Capital, when I'm looking at a founder, I'm looking at a founder of a business who has solved a problem for themselves. And they yep. had this aha moment. Yep. And now they're building a product or service to give that aha moment to other people, basically amplifying it. Mm -hmm. And so as, they're saw, as they continually build that project, they share that the, the solution to the problem that they're solving and they start to attract people yep. who are also had that problem or who also believe that that solution is right. Then you have the team of Avengers. Once you have the team of Avengers, <laughs> I, I've been using it because it just it resonates so well because yeah, everyone right understands. Yeah, yeah. Um, but once you have that team of Avengers, now you start making money right so your post product and your post revenue and so we were looking for folks right there in that sweet spot who were making around 200 to 500 thousand in revenue and now they're they're buzzing at the seams unless they get more capital right. to scale right and so when we're looking at a company that's the type of person i'm looking for and i know that's been uh, on the minds of a lot of people who come across us and who send emails right. to us that is one of the most frequent questions that we get i look at things a little bit differently here um because my very first business mm -hmm. um, uh, to catch folks up was uh, I was working as a doorman. I got an opportunity from one of the residents who he owned a franchise of dry cleaners. Mm -hmm. and he's like, yo, what are you doing behind the desk? Let me put you on. And I started by, you know, convincing people to give me their clothes and I would take it to his dry cleaner. Mm -hmm. And like it was a little side hustle. And then it grew into a full fledged business when we broke into the film and the TV industry. Um, but my first business did not result in me having a need mm. and being like oh aha you like i solved this problem that i had and so that's why i look at things a little bit differently because mm -hmm. i'm just personally jaded by my experience my only need was to gain my fucking independence yeah. and not live by another man's system because mm -hmm. it, for as long as i was going to be working in someone else's company i was i'm giving up the opportunity cost the i'm not yet the opportunity cost, and you're giving up the very special uh, mm. potential that we have in this life to design your own way. Yep. You literally can design your own way and do exactly what you want, and oftentimes exactly what you want doesn't exist, so you have to build it. Mm -hmm. And as long as you're existing within someone else's construct, 
you can't do that on your own. Yeah. So, so for me, <clears throat> now I do look at businesses as like, okay, what problem are they solving? Yeah. But it's important, especially for our communities, to nurture this thought that I don't, I don't think is talked about enough. Like, the the most important responsibility you have at first is just to empower yourself and build your yep. confidence and get your chops up. And my first business was not, you know, cleaning water for Africa. It was not sustainable <laughs> energy. It was not anything later fucking on, impactful. Later on. Later on. <laughs> what I did was I cleaned people's dirty underwear. Mm -hmm. But what that did was it built my confidence. And the very next thing I did was start an incubator. Mm -hmm. And now we're starting a fund, right? So yep. yesterday um, when someone someone asked me like, yo, you know, how can I think like an entrepreneur? Mm. I said, it's, it's, it, it comes in the legwork. When you yep. put in the legwork, your vision, you start developing your vision a little bit differently. Yep. So I can see things way differently now than I did seven years ago mm -hmm. because when you make those decisions, right? Like, so I came to a fork in the road where I decided to start my own business and I, you know, you make micro decisions in the day, in the day to day, and then those compound over time. Yeah. And as those compound and you make mistakes and you learn, your acumen starts developing. Mm -hmm. Now, if I look at the same thing, that the same opportunity that I would have seven years ago, my acumen is exalted. Mm, I'd be able exalted. to exalted. I'd be mm -hmm. able to say, mm, I know how I would approach this. Mm -hmm. I can call in this person, that person. I could do this approach, and and I can only imagine what it'll be twenty years from now. Wow. But to answer that guy's question again here on the podcast. Yep. It's not about learning to think like an entrepreneur first. It's doing and yeah. then your thinking develops. So to add to that, I think experience is the best teacher. People have always said quality over quantity, but I think that they are thinking about it a little bit wrong. Mm. You need quantity to get to quality. Ooh. You need to put in reps. Wasn't suiting with me in the gym. Uh, you need to get those reps in mm. to be able to um, have that quality and I was actually watching a Kobe Bryant, everything okay? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, was actually, I was actually watching a, a Kobe Bryant interview and you were talking about him going to work out at 4 a.m. And he broke down why he would do it, right? He said, guys wake up at 6 a.m. and they work out until like 12 and then they have another workout throughout the day. And so, so people are working out twice a day. And he's like, well, how do I get an edge? I gotta wake up at four. So I can get a third workout in. Mm. And then he says, or over the first year, you know, you, you see a few tweaks. Over year two and year three, you start to see some some spreading. And he's like, by year five, these guys are five years behind me. Damn. And I'm just literally getting extra reps in, which <laughs> is leads right to wow. the, the quantity leads to quality. He wasn't doing that when he was like 35, but he was definitely doing that when he was wow. 23, 24. Bro, I love that nugget. People say quality over quantity. For you, you think quantity leads to quality. Mm -hmm. So you work, to, so when you, this is for all the people who are looking to get into entrepreneurship, who are looking to get in venture capital or just startups. You have to work to learn, not work to earn. Right. When you first go, mm -hmm. right? Just like with the, with the Kobe analogy, like, you have to get more reps at the beginning right. to get to that quality. Yep. Then you eventually stop saying yes mm. and you start saying no. Yo, I think there's so much value in in challenging old sayings. Yeah. It's so weird, but I've been, especially like over the past two months even for me, mm -hmm. I've been like looking at old sayings that we just kind of use all mm -hmm. the time, like the penny saved, penny earned. <laughs> like Grant Cardone's, I was like, dude, it's still a penny. And like... <laughs> Like think bigger, right? Or yep. like quantity, quality over quantity is another one that you just broke for me. Like there's so many old sayings that are embedded in us that we mm -hmm. accept mm -hmm. and then perpetuate <laughs> without even like yeah. knowing if it's in accordance with our value system or whatever. So I think that's something that's been uh, top of mind lately. Let's switch gears real quick um, yeah. and just talk about something light before we close. Um, I don't know. What's something frivolous? Uh, what have you been listening to or listening what you've been to. watching or anything? Yeah, anything I mean, catch your mind? playoffs, like what? Playoffs. I mean, how do I want to, I, I, I wanted to bring this point up because I think it's been on my mind. It's just like the, how things are changing, video and voice and how they're like changing the game and how brands and companies and individuals are using it as a tool. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Tool belt. You have a wrench. You have a freaking screwdriver. You have all these things. These are all tools. Mm. And so, like for voice, for example, 
back in the day, radio killed it, blah, 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 blah. It died off. But now look how it came back, mm -hmm. right? Speaking, public speaking, professional speaking is a part of voice. Mm -hmm. uh, podcasting, a part of voice. Mm -hmm. Video podcasting, using them both together. Exactly. In terms of the videos, like TV died, but social media brought back video on a new platform, on, in, on the, like a new surface. So I kind of want to talk about like, what the heck is going on? Where do you see the future? Um, or like things that you see that are going to be different of how brands use voice in video. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, I don't know. Um, I don't think I have incredible foresight. Mm -hmm. and uh, Or how are you going to leverage it? Right, right. Um, I like that's probably a better question. Yeah, yeah. So that's I like that question. Um, and people ask me on panels and stuff. It, it tends to be one of the questions like, yo, where do you see things going? Yeah. And <clears throat> as I think about it, like I feel like an entrepreneur's real skill set should be learning to react in real time. Yeah. And I like it's, that. it's amazing how many people are still reacting to things from mm -hmm. two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like if you're reacting real time, like real time is the future. Mm -hmm. it, does that make sense? Yeah. Real time is the future. So for me, I'm just instead of thinking about where things are going in 10 years. And there's a lot of futurists that yeah. do that and like mm -hmm. Musk and stuff. And that's cool because that's like the that's kind their of vision. space, though. That's their ministry. Right. That's their <laughs> vision that they're blessed with. For me, I'm more in the real time and. I'm trying to submerge myself in how people are actually behaving and consuming stuff right mm -hmm. now. Um, and even with us doing this video podcast, it's funny because a part of me was like, damn, I'm late, you know, but another side of me is like, damn, it's really early. early. And I am shocked, shocked at the amount of people that do not put in the effort to build a web presence, bro. Wow. This web, is the number one thing. <sighs> web is augmented reality. Like there is the web, the like digital presence is augmented reality. Mm -hmm. Now we don't need fucking holograms for it to be augmented reality. It's true. The web is augmented reality, meaning it's an extension of the offline realm. And there's so much potential upside yeah. and such limited downside. It's free. It's free to do. It's just effort. And it's, it's still mind-blowing to me the amount of people that don't take the effort to build a web presence. It's done incredible wonders for mm -hmm. my career. You know, if, if we wouldn't have a brand for Harlem Capital, we would just be guys right. I would not be here. I would checks. be at like, a desk right now. Yeah. And so, <laughs> anyway, that's how I answered your question. It's like, for me, the real time is the future. Got you. And I'm just trying to get my quantity in so mm -hmm. I can get my quality up. Yo, and this this is an amazing way to, to, to end off the podcast. No, one thing that I will say is that, how do I say it? You are a media company, no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. No matter what your brand is, you are a media company. So why would you not be on every type of platform? And on top of that, why would you not curate your content for each respective platform? Yep in a very intentional way, mm -hmm. right? You don't post to Instagram and then just make that share to every... No. You post natively. Respect the medium, guys. Every, yes, respect the medium. Mm -hmm. You post natively to every platform. On top of that, with video, like we were saying with LinkedIn and Twitter and all these other things, like there is... It's a land grab right now, mm -hmm. right? With people who can create quality, decent video. But it's really not that hard. For me, if you don't have money for mics a videographer, a photographer, somehow give somebody value. Give them introductions. Mm. Um, bring them around to the right events. That's a good nugget, man. And do do whatever you can. Become creative. Mm -hmm. Become extremely creative, intuitive, witty, scrappy. Mm. And people respect that because, again, what is that? That's a vision right. that no one else can see. But they can feel that. But they can feel that, right? right? Like, right. And then what happens? You start attracting people. Mm-hmm into your atmosphere into your orbit into your orbit and, and then you become a sun in a galaxy this we see the sun all the time but the sun is just a small little thing and there's millions of galaxies right. in the world but the sun still gets to eat and do its thing every day it, mm -hmm. it still gets to ha be a winner right. and so we potentially sometimes have to be our our own sun of a, of the galaxy but right. we need to make sure that we do the right things to make other planets, you know, um, have a gravitational pull around right. us. And, and that's adding value. The sun adds so much value to everything that happens on Earth, right? Mm, mm, we wouldn't exist without it. Mm -hmm. And and 
I like that people think that the value has to be money mm-hmm. and you just share that it doesn't have to There's be. There's so many ways to add v- value outside of monetary. Right. Dude, I love this show. Um, this is great. Great chop it up session. Yes. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Well, actually, I appreciate you. definitely want you guys to continue to comment and DM us and text us and let us know what we should talk about. Yeah, well, and I have a question for you guys. Um, just want to know right now, what is one thing that's happening in pop culture mm-hmm. um, that is eliciting a strong emotional response from you? Is there anything that you strongly disagree with or strongly agree with? I want to know. It could be anything from you know Kanye to Trump to Wakanda uh, uh, to Wakanda <laughs> to media. You know, what one thing in pop culture right now is top of mind uh, and really driving a strong emotional response? Let us know in the comments. Um, until then, guys, this is JH again. Yo, this is BB. And this is Chop It Up Show Episode 2. Thanks for listening, guys. Th- thank you, guys. Peace.